Hello Acid Horizon fans. Today, we are graced with the presence of two guests, Natasha Eves and someone whom many of us know, Matt Calhoun from Repeater Books. Both Natasha and Matt had the distinct honor of working with Mark Fisher during his time teaching at Goldsmiths. Today's discussion involves Mark Fisher's work on rave culture and surrounding concepts. Please be advised that some of the discussion involves Mark's suicide and the grief surrounding it. But before we get into the mix, now's a great time to like or subscribe wherever you're listening. Also, check our links. We have blogs, we have a merch store, and of course, we have our Patreon site. Coming very soon, all of us on the podcast will be joining in on what we're calling an early semester office hours. Stop by with us for about 60 to 90 minutes to talk primarily about our approaches to writing in philosophy. What are some writing challenges that you have as an academic? How do you overcome them? What are some ways that you get inspired? What are some strategies that you can employ to do some long-term research? These are just some of the things that we intend to share during this seminar. Also during this seminar, we'll talk about writing on writing from some of our favorite figures like Nietzsche and Deleuze, for example. These informal events are just a great time to get acquainted with everybody who's involved with the podcast. Okay, without further ado, here's Matt, Natasha, and the rest of the Acid Horizon gang. Welcome to Acid Horizon, the theory podcast. It's Adam here with Matt and Will, and today we're joined by guests Natasha Eves and returning champion Matt Colhoun to talk about the rave, jungle, the constructing spaces, collective ecstasy, and joy. Today we're going to focus on their own experiences constructing such spaces, through their ongoing promotion of the 4K Punk Club Nights in memory of Mark Fisher, and which often, if not always, follow the Mark Fisher Memorial Lectures at Goldsmiths. On top of these experiences, we're also going to chat about the relevance of Jungle and the Rave for Fisher's work across his earlier and later periods, and the radical possibilities of the Rave as a space of ecstatic consciousness raising, creating new collective subjectivities in our most precarious of times. Natasha and Matt, welcome to Acid Horizon. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. I was reading back the interview you did for, for Huck a while back, Natasha, with a few people about it, when is it coming to start the 4K Punk Nights? And the question that would come up in as the motivating question of this was, well, what about the music? Well, <laughs> it's, you know, what about the music? Why, why did the memorial function of the Fisher Lectures feel so incomplete without a, a good old-fashioned sesh at the end of it? Well, I guess this thing, because even with approaching these nights, we were never... Like, even though it is what about the music, it was more about what music can generate, which is that sense of community and that sense of being together in a space. And as you say, that kind of like that ecstatic joy <laughs> that happens of being together. And, and it's just something that's not necessarily possible within the format of like an academic lecture. Like, because the academic lecture is very, it's very good and it's all fine. And like, I'm so glad that like the memorial lectures happened, but it was that thing of like, we just didn't want mark to become like another sort of i think is ossified the word i'm looking for <laughs> like like another just like you know like object of culture like wanted it to be something that was lively that was full of life and also could be transformed by everyone that we invited to do these nights as well because that's been part of it is how it continually changes every year um with like the creativity that each person brings to it as well um that is yeah that is just beyond that sort of lecture hall format i guess considering how we'd initially tried to memorialize mark for ourselves like the initial experiences that we all had i think the week after mark unfortunately passed and we all were gathered in his classroom and then there was like these different assembly meetings and we'd have reading groups and these were all like really lovely things to do but and I guess it's like, you know, we were just also students at the time. So there was this kind of natural dichotomy between being in this institution, just doing what you do, the kind of activities that are sort of made possible by that space. But that's not just where it was restricted to. We were also then just going out for the night and sort of having occasions in the pub or we go to like or the club. And I think there was like the the zero nights that Hyperdub puts on or started putting on the first one was the week after mark died and going to that and it was steve goodman code nine doing like a just a i think every january as as, as the years have gone on he always does like a six hour set like code nine just runs the whole night and so the first like hour or so of that very first evening was just 
and Steve playing loads of Mark's like favorite songs or songs that Mark could like contribute towards. And that again wasn't really planned, but I think it really defined our own relationship just to sort of grieving in a way, but one that was really sort of like healing, I think, too. And I guess it's just an attempt to try and share that 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 side of things as well as you know inviting people into the institution like we invite you in and then let's all just go out you just reminded me actually yeah because it's I, yeah i forgot that's how that's all how it all started really is like it was lots of very natural coming together of people quite a lot that first ma class like after mark died it was like yeah you had everyone sort of sat in a circle and you know, it's like it's all very like stilted and very like people sitting with their grief, which obviously is incredibly important. And like to be able to sit with those feelings, and they were discussing like memories of Mark and stuff. But then um, we kind of interrupted the space to ask, well, what if we just put one of his mixes on? And it was something that felt very natural, very kind of like, and it really sort of like punctured that the stiltedness of that moment and the stillness of it and kind of was that moment in which everyone started talking to each other and everyone actually started discussing things and like in a much more kind of well yeah like friends rather than just kind of like in an institutional space we're all just kind of like sat in the circle with our chairs or like it's like group therapy or something and instead it just became something else and it was the first time I met Matt um was in that first MA class after Mark died and um, and again, even that hyperdub night on the Wednesday, um, <laughs> before that, in the in some of the art studios at the back of campus, we um, some of the undergraduates and myself, and yeah, that was it. Because Visual Cultures had just done this big like kind of memorial meeting in which everyone again, it was like a similar thing of everyone talking about Mark and like just expressing their grief and kind of having that shared moment. And then me and some of the fine art and history of art students. Um, we're like, we can't just let everyone disappear after this memorial meeting. Like, we can't just let everyone just go off and be individuals and, you know, like sitting in their bedrooms, feeling that grief on their own. And so, um, and so we were like, we're going to do a party in the studios. And like one room had Sapphire and Steel, like on the screen, I think another, and then the other room was like the music and, and everyone just gathered. And then, and then we all collectively went to the hyperdub night afterwards. And it was just, again, it's like the way that the, the kind of the party and the gathering just sort of allowed us to come together in a way that made sense to us. It sounds like it sort of collectivized what might have otherwise been a really sort of individualized uh, moment where rather than each of you trying to, you know, confront this as, you know, lone individuals, instead you're sort of coming to terms with this as a group, sort of, as, as you say, sort of bound by, um, you know, Mark's writing, by the music, by the proximity and the rest of it. So it, it, sort of, it sounds like it collectivized that in a way which perhaps Mark would also appreciate given his, you know, his worries about, you know, um, the, this sort of lack of um, collective solidarity and, 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 and so on. It's quite funny, really, because, I mean, I know that we were, you, you um, looking at the Mark's essay, No Romance Without Finance. So yeah, so that essay is in, I think it's on the Fancy website. I think it's also in the big K-Punk volume. And we did like a session around it, I think maybe when we sort of thought we wanted to do the K-Punks to be a more than one thing. But I guess that was kind of, it's, it's, it's funny reading those texts of Mark's back in a way, because they're, as much as they're validating and they sort of, because I guess a lot of the, the very first sort of few paragraphs of that essay, Mark's talking about like this sense of, working class individuals for, for sort of mandatory individuals in the US sort of feeling like having like a, a sense of hardened subjectivity you can't rely on yourself so you that 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 kind of consciousness deflation that lack of solidarity Mark's reading this book where you know he sort of shows the very real like material restrictions that kind of emerge or that you kind of implement for yourself when you live in this kind of system and then he sort of talks about ways of getting out of that and it's funny to read that now because it kind of can see almost like this was what we were thinking about at the time, but just not in necessarily in those terms. It just kind of became, it did come quite naturally, but I think mainly just maybe because of Mark's sort of implicit influence. I don't think anyone was explicitly theorizing and referencing uh, <laughs> the people that Mark throws in. I think it's got Wendy Brown in there and Nancy. Nancy Hartsock. Nancy Hartsock, yeah. We, I don't I don't remember hearing those names necessarily while we're sort of discussing what we wanted to do, but it just kind of, I think it showed how, you know, it doesn't have to be that. 
I guess that's kind of maybe the part of that tension of what about the music? It's not to dismiss the theory, but kind of show how it's not looking to theory as an instruction manual. Sometimes it's just being able to express something that you we're all already capable of doing that doesn't have to be some sort of specific, highly trained avant-garde activity. You can literally just like put on a club night and suddenly you read this text and you're like, oh shit, we, yeah, we did that. <laughs> And that in itself, I think, is like not even like it's validating, but an, an empowering, right? Like more than just like it's not so much about it's not an ego trip to be like, oh yeah, we just did it. But you know, it's like it's it, it's it's finding yourself nav- validated in that way. I think like really set stage for a a lot of us going forwards, like on a really like on a I was saying not on a, not not just on a personal level, but on a collective level, like made sort of grounding how like this these can help us get through this horrible situation and actually come out of it you know with really strong friendships and with a kind of different relationship to the world like going forwards and i think that it was just really important for all of us to try and encourage and share that as much as possible you know with with very much with everything that happened in mind as if to sort of yeah pull something out of that kind of situation that was went so much further yeah, it's definitely wrong to oppose the, the theoretical and the affectional sides of the lecture and the, the four K-punk likes aren't definitely in opposition. And it was incredibly explicit this in the last year's show where I was just, you know, you know sort of dancing in my room while hearing Ice Boy Violet shout about Leotard. And I'm like, this is fucking amazing. <laughs> like, like, why did I go to these when, when in-person things were legal? It reminds me a little bit of um, the memorial uh, sort of talk that Robin McKay, McKay did on the Fisher function and how this, this sort of, in a way that sort of the afterlife of the lecture is the function, is the Fisher function that creates these sort of collective spaces where the theory, the theoretical and the aesthetic aren't necessarily in contrast. I mean, I love the reading the interview uh, that you did, Sasha, about the Cardi B would have loved, sorry, Mark Fisher would have loved Cardi B. I mean, Cardi B may still love Mark Fisher, but <laughs> the, the Mark Fisher would love Cardi B uh, scarves. <laughs> I mean, I want one. I will track one down. Um, we're making it Craig on it or something. But <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. I mean, I I made them, and I'm not making any more. So <laughs> you're going to have to find one in the wild. I think I'm afraid. But you um, like more brilliant in the sun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the thing. But that's yeah, it's exactly that. It's like it's what Robin's talking about with the Fisher function. That's what I mean when in terms of just like Mark's work kind of like li- like living through us like in like in practice as well and I think it's, it's, it's the thing of like especially when you read Barack Sunburst and this kind of uh, what is it it talks about the kind of the carnival excess and the collective joy and all these sort of things and I mean it's it's partly like yeah it's partly like like what Mark was like as a teacher it's sort of like he like he engineered something else like within within his classes within his students that just sort of um I don't know it it felt like you didn't have to approach things in the way that you'd always been that you were told you had to (laughs) I don't know if that made any sense but it's kind of like it's sort of um yeah I don't know there was a real kind of freedom in a lot of ways with like with having Mark as a teacher and sort of like even the way he approached the classes themselves it's kind of like it was just him at the front of the classroom teaching stuff that made him really excited about the world and about music and about everything else. And it was like, it's almost, and it was always one of those moments, like especially as an undergraduate and having, having him as a teacher was, it was almost like seeing like the, like this, like this light bulb moment for all the working class students of being like, Oh my God, I didn't know that I could do academia like this. I didn't know I could write about the stuff I already knew about. And it was like, it was a total sort of light bulb moment of like, of going from feeling quite alienated from academia. And it's it's exactly what Robin talk, talks about in his eulogy of, um, I can't remember the exact phrasing, but it's like um, Mark's adamant working class methodology of of thinking through pop culture and, uh, and how he can't do anything but that. And it's sort of... Um, and it was so, and it was so genuine with him as well. It's not like, it was never, it never felt contrived. Like it wasn't just someone being like, Oh, I'm going to bring in this to feel relevant. Like it was sort of like, it was the way that he thought. And he showed us that if we think that way too, it's like, you don't have to constantly talk about, I don't know, Caravaggio or something. It's like, you can talk about the jam. You could talk about David Bowie. You could talk about Grace Jones and mm. other more contemporary stuff that I 
haven't quite referenced. You could talk about Drake. You could talk about <laughs> Kanye West, like all this kind of stuff. And it's just like that was mm. one of the most magical, exciting things about coming to contact with him and continues to be for like for us as like as a group of people who were like interested mm. in his work and his like incredible diagnostic skills of what the hell is wrong with society. <laughs> There was a great phrase in one of the, I think it might be the interview, where it says Mark Fisher knew his place and turned it into a methodological weapon. He was a working class man who sort of knew his place and then used that to, in the Lukakian way of, oh, I know my place, I know how to occupy it, and I know the potentials of, you know, sort of lines of escape there. And that's where you get the pop culture aspects of way of teaching Leo Tard or the last Guattari and all of the other dead Frenchmen, you know. <laughs> <laughs> It's true. I feel like there's like a. I remember I used to have a lecturer before. I didn't have the. I, I didn't have the, the the pleasure of being a, a, a one of Mark's undergrad students. But being in a, when I was I was doing mine in Newport in South Wales, and it's kind of interesting because there wasn't really the same. Tellingly, there wasn't the same sort of mode of expression of talking about like what it's like to to be in a working class town like that and how. Um, how that makes you feel really and how it makes you yeah, it makes you feel about your especially doing an arts degree i guess like how it makes you feel about your position in society and what you're able to contribute to it but i remember there was always this there was this one lecturer who was a bit of a rebel who always just used to talk about um do what you like but just don't just try and avoid falling into what he would call a neoliberal professionalism which felt like a nice buzzword at the time and i guess people don't like when you talk about neoliberalism as a kind of buzzword but i kind of feel like there's a pressure to be both very much for yourself doing your own thing for your own sake that nevertheless requires you to, and this was in this context anyway, of, of a, it requires you to kind of like brown nose whoever's above you as if there's like you want entry into a kind of club as a kind of individual. Like there's a kind of like a like paradox there almost. And it's kind of telling that we're going and then hearing a lot of Marx stuff. And it's kind of interesting because that's the one thing that's, sort of strange about Goldsmith as a place. Like a lot of these things are literally written on the walls. When when Natasha was saying that, I just I just really recently picked up Richard Hogarth's book, The Uses of Literacy. So there's the, one of the main buildings at Goldsmith is called the Richard Hogarth building. He's just a name that you just wouldn't think. I mean the other one's Stuart Hall, which is probably a bit more everyone knows Stuart Hall is. But it's interesting that like you live you go to this kind of university where for all of its sort of stereotypes and it has plenty, but there's this there is this sense that a certain kind of response to culture is held up above all that and it kind of makes a sort of contradiction like to, to to name a building after someone like Stuart Hall or Richard Hogarth Richard Hogarth's whole thing is like what does it mean to what what is a what are the positives and negatives of, of working class people being able to access mass culture what's the difference between mass culture and popular culture like mass culture from above popular culture that emerges from below having those kind of, I, I mean i've only I graduated from Goldsmiths what five years ago and never really realized that this guy whose name's on a building actually was talking you know i don't know maybe that if that disparity is as obvious as it sort of seems to me where you have that kind of talk that's nevertheless held aloft and it's that kind of strange contradiction that sort of i mean it's not a contradiction but at least maybe compared to other places but i don't know it's natasha <laughs> but that's kind of the case in point right it's like that's what happens yeah, when yeah. you just that's no but that's what happens when you name a building after someone and you don't keep alive what they actually do it's like they just right, become exactly, a name on yeah. a building that's like if goldsmiths had been like well this is the mark fisher building and everyone's like who the hell's Mark Fisher? Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's kind of like, and this is why, like, yeah. having the party space is so important because it's kind of like, someone doesn't just become another dead theorist, like another dead theorist name. Like, it's kind of like, how do you, it's how do you keep that alive? And it's yes. partly, I mean, maybe it is the thing with like the mass culture. Cause I mean, Stuart Hall's like, Stuart Hall's like stuff on television is really fascinating. And like, for me, it's always been my access to Stuart Hall was like, uh, what was it? Ain't half racist, mum. It's like brilliant and it's like, but that's partly the yeah. thing. It's like, it's these these modes of kind of like, it's A, what about the music? But also B, how do they not just become a name on a sodden building? And that's sort of it. I guess that's it. Yeah. I think that's what I was kind of trying to, I think you gestured towards it. You, you clarified it rather, I should say, far better than I did. But I guess I wanted to, I kind of wanted to come back to like how the, maybe the, the sort of one of the initial acts sort of contrary to that before the, the nights was when everyone stenciled the quote that's kind of went everywhere. I feel like that that picture's seen all over the place now. Um, and I remember that's kind of I was I, re, I was thinking about it when reading the Hook article earlier because they kind of used that 
as the sort of isn't it the the header is the the picture of it unfinished when everyone's like there in the middle of the night like stenciling it to the side of the wall which wasn't done with permission right it was just just done it wasn't it wasn't (laughs) it was kind of like there was like a student union motion passed like years before that said that that wall could be a mural wall, but no one had ever done anything for it. And luckily there was one person yeah. who knew this and remembered this. And so we put it up. But then I remember there was a thing where people thought Goldsmiths had put that mural up and they were being like, oh, university, like capitalizing on it. And we were like, no, 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 no. Like we did it to make sure that he had a presence on that campus still, like, because that was really important. Yeah. <laughs> But I guess that's it, right? It's like when 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 that's kind of the first. Like that was sort of the week or two after. I think. No, it was February. I remember it because I unfortunately what didn't take part in it, and I kind of really kicked myself for it. But it was, it was the night before the for a bit. It was the night before the yeah for the, the memorial. memorial. Yeah. But I remember like how that. I remember that question coming up about whether it was the institution or not, and I guess that's maybe part of what's so important about the to kind of bring it back to the club nights in sort of a roundabout way, like when that was the option that it felt like we had, like what what could you do on campus? And when that immediately felt, started to feel, even the thing that you could do that was like, I think it seems quite iconic now and um, and was with all the best intentions could nevertheless still get confused and be kind of like taken over by assumptions made about it from other corners. And when you have a lecture and then you have a club night, there's not really... There's not really too much confusion about who's doing this. It's not. It's not like you know, senior management's not <laughs> asking like people to come and throw a rave in uh, in like a squatted building in um, in wherever or or even in the student union. Like the night that we put on in the student union, I think the last in person one was even that was pretty wild. <laughs> but like that was it, it could only come from it, it was clearly could only come from the students. Um, and I think that was like really important. Like it was so, it was so obviously from below. Like that, I think that, and that was. I think maybe that's part. Of, like I kind of feel like we're even still just talking about what about the music. I feel like me and that was sort of vaguely talking about it a bit before we came on. And I feel like for us, there's so much packed into that sort of dismissive like question. Like it, it's all about. It's not just about what yeah music in any sort of literal sense, but kind of that. Well, that kind of rape culture thing, yeah, of like of coming from below or outside of or um, making that kind of gesture that can't really be, that's kind of unrepresentable almost. Like you can't, it, 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 it's nothing that could come from some other nefarious force that's wanting to appropriate this shit. Like it's just so clearly not. And that's, I think, part of its power, like that that's so obvious. Yeah, because it seems that there's a latent theory of space in what you're doing, because you're talking about the putting the name on the wall, you know, renaming things to Mark Fisher Hall or something. There's, a, there's that top-down structure which simply labels space, whereas there's an entirely sort of, not to get too Deleuze and Atari about it, but there's almost kind of an entirely new movement in which the, the club night doesn't see the space as something to name and simply that ossify, as you were saying, Tasha, but it's a space that you have to seize and occupy. Because... There's been many Mark Fisher memorial buildings because every time that there's a memorial lecture, I went there a couple of years ago and I saw them have overflow rooms. That became the Mark Fisher memorial building in a sort of more imminent way because it was, it was occupied. It's, I, I, I'm tempted to say the word, it's supposed to be a bit of a war machine that sees spaces as a way of being occupying rather than you know, it sort of smooths out all these spaces because you just can't fit everybody in. You know, like the, the the war machine of come bursty into a space and force them to play Life of Pablo all evening. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot about that. And, um, and I, I think it's a good place to move on to what Mark thought about the rave and why it was so relevant, and thinking about how the rave uh, constructs itself in a relationship to space and how that threatens certain kinds of capitalist modes of domination, particularly going off of the piece from the the rave book on. Um, uh, rock sunburst. Rock yes. Okay. How would you relate of the construction of a rave night to theories of space in relation to property and capital? How Mark thought about how you construct spaces in general? I feel like this is a question that me and Natasha may have both very different answers for. Uh, I was about to say because, that. <laughs> yeah. If only, if only because, like, but I feel like this is kind of the. For me, it's not. 
My, my favorite thing about Dulles and Guattari, if we're going to sort of just go and start it's <laughs> with, with them too, go for it. it's always, but not even in like a heavy theoretical sense, like just on a, on a, on a basic like relationship as a reader, is that the thing I always say about Dulles or Guattari and or Guattari is that they, they, they're, especially in something like A Thousand Plows, they're doing what they're talking about. There's not a distinction between um, the theory and the doing. It's theory as cultural production. It's theory as I mean, well, I mean, it, and that makes a lot of sense on the page. Then you do you, if you take that out and you're like, well, I'm this is theory as rave. This is a rave as a theory. That starts to sound a bit wanky, but in a way, like it, it, it's. I feel like it, for us, it was just a case of like doing what we're talking about. And I mean, I feel like me and Natasha have spoken a lot over the years of me being maybe the more anally theoretical one. Partly why I sort of cherish our friendship is Natasha drags me out of like my bedroom. <laughs> she drags me off Twitter, <laughs> and that's like, and I feel like that's part of like the. I, we, 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 so, so in a way, I'm like, there is, there are, pl- there's plenty of theory, and there's plenty that you can say in terms of a theory of space. But I feel like, in a way, like the if there is a strength in our dynamic as two friends, is that like Natasha just does it. And I kind of, in that sense, I'm more, I want to kick, despite the sort of theoretical setup, I want to kick it over to Natasha because I feel like you're way more, you have way more experience doing the practical sort of work in that regard. If I can just jump in and say that everyone, everyone needs that one friend who does just tell you to log off Twitter. Right. <laughs> for, me, for me, it's Matt. I mean, right. that's why I'm here. <laughs> everyone needs that. It's like, right. yeah. You two have found it. Twitter is not a good place. <laughs> Um, okay, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's the thing, that's the thing with the, so practically, with space, it's like, practically a lot of it is like, we've been very blessed when doing the nights with having access to art spaces who allowed us to use their space for free. And basically, a lot of being able to do this is having the resources behind you, right? Whether that's access to free space, and like, that's why Rave is so important, because it's like, they just took space and made it their own. And that was always one of the best things about using, like, um, about using the art spaces. Like, we used we used Set Dalston for a couple of the nights, um, and because, yeah, it's just when when you're not having to like budget for a space, it completely frees up what you can do. And it's kind of like because it's it's not. And one of the main things behind us doing the nights is it was never about making money. Like, that's like it's never been about making money. Like it's always been about what the night is and how we can make that happen. Like, and we've always been very, and it's like, it's one of those things of like, you're simultaneously freed by that. Like you're freed by the fact that there's no, that you're not, you're not obeying the market, but you're also limited by the fact that you do have limited resources at your day. And this is the same with any like DIY project uh, or anything like this. And it's sort of, um, and it's why for some of the years, like we were also very blessed that Goldsmiths gave us like money. <laughs> um, but even that was really piecemeal. And again, it's kind of like it means you have to like really think outside the box to make to make these things happen. And uh, but also how it can shift as well. And like the sensibility can shift once you start to move into these different spaces, once you start to move into the club night or the student union, in which everything is kind of like, well, if you make this much money on the bar, then we uh you know, you can stay open this late and we'll give you this much discount. And you start to think about it in a different way. And it's, it kind of kills half the joy of it. Um, it's having to do like this kind of uh, largely creative accounting, <laughs> having to think about it in that way. Um, <laughs> but like, but yeah, it's like... <laughs> Can't believe you said that. <laughs> we've, we've, our work's always balanced somehow. It's true. Um, but like, and there's the thing that's sort of, uh, yeah. and it is that it, cause this thing, it's always the thing that we've always tried to do is like, with some core values that we core values, God, with some, we just try to do it with certain ethics. Like it's like, we always like for the January <laughs> event, we always want it to be free entry because it's sort of like, if you want a space to have everyone in it, everyone needs to be able to get in there. And it's kind of, and that's sort of like, that was one of the fundamental things. And it's also why we're often limited by what we can do, because we want it to be free for everyone. We want people to access, but we also want like the DJs to be like paid for their time because like, you know, people also shouldn't work for free, but you know, there's a lot of stuff to figure out. And I think that's the thing. It's like, it's like in terms of like these enclosures of space as well, that keeps, that keep happening. It's, it's like, it, 
it's continually that frustration, especially if you have ideas of stuff you'd like to do, like in terms of like, wouldn't it be amazing one year if we could do like the after party, like outside in a field. But then it's like, if you want to go through the proper things, you have to go through the council, you have to get all the proper permissions, you have to get like a late night license. There's all these kind of like ridiculous things. And then with like the, um, the new like police powers bill or whatever it's called, the kill, the thing that the kill the bill protests were about. It's like, there's still this, there's still continually this like enclosure space that you're always, you're always up against because, and I think that's something we've definitely felt because it's something, um, even though it's not run by the university, because it's tied to the memorial lecture, we still kind of have to follow, you know, certain, <laughs> certain procedures so we can, advertise it so we can actually be like oh this is actually going to happen <laughs> and um and it, it, is, it is limiting and it's constantly frustrating to not just be able to do what you want and this is one of the like for me one of the most utopic parts of rave is like and especially my friends who continue to host like free parties and stuff like that is just like their attitude of um of kind of just fuck it like this is going to happen and what what will happen is what's going to happen if the police come the police come and it's like having like your escape routes for your for your equipment and all this kind of stuff and um i mean i and it's like and this is the thing with like the memorial lectures like, i'd love to do it that way <laughs> it'd be an absolute blast but especially in london there's whole other things going on that i'm not going to get into there's always a clash between like the marketplace and the space you want and navigating that in a practical sense has always been like, is always the biggest headache. <laughs> Fisher talks about this in the um, Baroque Sunburst essay, right? This sort of um, ongoing process, you know, he's talking sort of the English or British British context, sort of the enclosure and regulation of these various spaces, such that it, it stamps out or at least tries to stamp out exactly the kind of thing that you're talking about, right? Part of what rave culture was about was the spontaneity to the extent of it, right? That it was sort of, Maybe there was some planning, but it sounds like a lot of it was just they'd find like a empty warehouse or something or an abandoned flat or whatever. And now that's just that's just now the rave space. That's just what it is now, right? Um, insofar as it's now occupied. But he does talk about the ways in which the uh, various laws, force of the state and police and so on, have made that more and more difficult to uh, to happen. I was wondering if you had any thoughts about what sort of purpose that serves, the, the sort of the, the, the reasons why these spaces are being sort of, you know, sort of enclosed in a certain sense and then more strictly regulated. I mean, it's also, enclosed is almost the wrong word, right? Because one of the things you were just talking about was that as as you're organising these memorials and, and so on, you know, even though it's not strictly tied to the university, there's almost this sort of porous relationship with the rules and things that they're going to require in order for it to get off the ground, which makes it more difficult. So I wonder if you had any thoughts about what, what sort of purpose does that, that serve to to make this more difficult well it's just control at the end of the day it controls what it does and it makes sure that like whatever whatever money can be produced in that space gets turned back and like is turned into capital and that's like and that's what this continually happens it's like um it's like someone someone wants to make their buck at the end of the day <laughs> and it's always i think yeah it's always a, it's like as mark says in like the in the Baroque sunburst, it's always that subduing of that collective energy. And it's like, and it's what we come up against, even like, even outside of the rave space, like even within our work, within our everyday lives, it's like, you just continually are met with like some kind of professionalized culture or like managerial class. who will tell you that what you want to do with your life isn't possible because your leisure time has to be recaptured into something that's dull again <laughs> and something that they can make money off of. Yeah to domesticate you at the end of the day. And it's almost like there's this sort of chaotic, yeah, yeah, so that's actually the word I'd, I'd sort of go for from what I can, what I can see from, you know, the reading we've done, what we talked about is, it's almost like there's this focus point in, in these moments of this sort of raw, cha quite chaotic energy, right, which isn't constrained by, um, you know, all these rules and regulations and laws and so on. People just, you know, again, they get along a lot of the time, right? But that that sort of more chaotic energy has, it, it's almost like it has to be brought back within the normal goings on of society. You can't do that. You know, you can't say that. You can't dress like that, etc. That moment in which people say, no, fuck you, I'll do what I want. It has to be suppressed and then redirected straight back into ways in which that can be, you know, valorized and so on. 
Yeah, it seems in a certain sense that like the the problem of uh, these spaces too is precisely enclosure as well. That this is outside the grasp of immediate power in a sense, right? That the method of differentiation that exists here is not one um, that is authorized, one that is immediately capable of being sort of decoded and re-rendered. It's not a, an authorized show with adequately ticketed participation. It seems that what stuck out to me in the the very beginning of the Baroque sunburst piece was that the act of 1994 looked arbitrary initially. And what we see here is also like a particular formulation of power and of space in relation to access to that space, right? What, what, wh- who was given access to that space was precisely not those who were, de- who were deemed it, right? The, the very problem of the rave was that there was no process of deeming adequate access to that space. So it seemed like it was out of the immediate grasp of power like that of the squatters or the unauthorized campsites, it was precisely that there was a problem of the act of deeming. So when it says that it looks sort of draconian in its targeting of rave culture, it seems to me that that's like the perfect functioning of this system, is that it functions perfectly when it can bear down on the rave, not just on these these immediately uh, accessible acts of differentiation that don't correspond directly to the way in which we understand, let's say, uh, enjoyment under neoliberalism. It was precisely that it was an enclosed act in the certain sense that it wasn't directly linked up that, that made it an immediate problem for enforcement of this Public Order Act of 1994. I think Mark does this too, right, in the Baruch Sumbos essay, where he kind of links it directly to the policies of enclosure from like the... 20s and 30s or even well i guess even before then in the 19th century but but it's kind of telling almost that how you to follow that line you see as you say will like that kind of the arbitrariness that like has to be implemented like as if to say that the sort of scare tactics that are made about why rave is bad why it's acting outside well it's like a melting pot for criminality it's all about drugs it's about drinking it's about criminal damage it's about whatever else you know like the, the, the remember the i mean i remember i was like three but i remember in hindsight like the, <laughs> i remember in hindsight that there would be that one of the excuses that you'd hear that wasn't the adverage of just drugs would be like for farmers it's just it's like it's destroying land or something which is so so linked to that sense of enclosure from like you know that you get like the kinder kinder part not was it kinder scout trespass in the in the 30s but you know, but yeah, I guess that it's it it kind of becomes sort of funny when what you end up legislating at the end of the day is just dancing, um, and it's kind of that Deleuze Guattarian point about like desiring production, right? Like it, like fundamentally, what is being a, a desire is producing something that capitalism isn't satisfying, and even if it's and that that can be like a when that comes to drug culture, that can be a certain kind of high. When that that kind of pleasure, that kind of enjoyment, is as is as innocuous as collectivity and dancing to music, it kind of shows, like, yeah, like just that, yeah, that the, the arbitrage that you're talking about is just. But I guess that's kind of, I think, what we that's that's sort of the nub almost between what Natasha is describing. I think where you talk about how you just have to navigate these different bureaucracies. As if to say that that's the case sort of in the 90s, but it's strange how that's even sort of progressed further, that capitalism now makes space for this sort of thing where you can, you know, it makes space for different kinds of identity or um, or action, but it has to be rendered in a way that's readable to the overarching system. It already has to be accounted for in a sense. So yeah. the, the fact that these these other worlds manifest, right? These these sort of new forms of life can come in with like sort of an ephemeral opposition to it is extremely dangerous, and it's extraordinarily uh, contagious. So Fisher pulls a little bit on on Foucault's discipline and punish, and if we look at his research when he was writing that book, and and one thing that I think is is interesting uh, about Fisher is I I think the way in which he incorporates all of these different a French theorist. But just to put the pin in, in Foucault for a second, one of the dangerous elements here for power is is precisely dealing with the way in which 
the worker spends their leisure time. There's this new, one of the new developments of the post-industrial world is a deeper and deeper and deeper investment in precisely the leisure of the population rather than just the work of the population. So I think that when we when we look at these sort of competing worlds that pop up, when we say that uh, it, it seems like it's it's just a draconian measure, a, a sort of step into the grotesque, you know, bearing down on dancing, it seems to me like, no, that's just like the perfect place to plant to plant your flag. It's kind of funny too how that would like, I think, affect kind of going back to that, um, like if there was a Mark Fisher building at some point on Goldsmiths, like I feel like that, that would even be the, you kind of see, because that's kind of, a, I guess, another example of that process too, right? But it's funny how I think then we'd find it coming back in. And I know that, I mean, this kind of really bothered us both in a, in a certain way. Uh, I remember when we had the the last IRL, the last IRL, the la- well, the, before the pandemic. <laughs> Just, been online for too long but the last meet space one that we had at the uh at the su at goldsmiths was uh i remember like we'd over we'd come sometimes over here like comments about people that were making it the night and i remember we had jennifer walton down who did this most it, well it was quite interesting how then the, that night kind of went we started off and we had mark lecky opening who did this quite um uh, I mean, Mark like he's an old school raver in a way. Like he sort of had this m- mix that he prepared that had like throbbing gristle in and a bunch of gabber at the end. And there was, like, there was a post punk. And then we had um, uh, a, a post punk band play live. It's kind of our f- uh, first sort of live actual set, which was kind of great. And then it kind of like just They were called Tetine, kind of by the way. Tetine, Tetine. I'm glad you said that because it was totally escaped my brain for a minute and I didn't want to. Brazilian um, post punk with uh, Bruno Werner and uh, Elliot uh, Mejorado. Yeah, which was amazing. And then we kind of like sort of sped up from there and it ended the last two sets were um, we had RKSS and Jennifer Walton. You missed and Chukli, together, by the like, way. Oh, and Chukli, yes, of course. Um, and I guess there was this like really nice transition from Lecky to to Jen, where you there was. I mean, it was. Again, I'm trying to cut my story short, but when Jen was playing, she was playing like a lot of sort of hyper pop, intense, just insanity. Um, uh, and I remember hearing people being like, it wandered in, knowing this was like the Mark Fisher after party, and being like. Would Mark Fisher have been into this? Like, where's Barry? Where's the burial? Like, where, what's this kind of like intensely, um, like this? This what's this hyperpop like madness? Um, but that kind of felt like a part of that process creeping back in. I guess is my point, right? That even if there isn't a Mark Fisher building, this kind of Mark Fisher version, this Mark Fisher TM trademarked version that has a very, you know, fixed interest points which i guess is part of the the sort of gesture of natasha's scarves of like mark fisher would have loved cardi b the uh, the response to that is always would he though and it's like well how do you know like and why would you limit the fact that he that he may or may not have like even just like it's allowing those two things to sit together is generative in itself and that and challenges i think like you know that the, the even putting mark in his own kind of posthumous enclosure um, like all of that sort of, it, it sort of is interscalar at that stage where it's not just about like how we can have a rave outside of these bureaucracies, but even just in challenging people's expectations, it's it's becomes like the, you know, chance a different kind of interiority. Um, and in every instance, I feel like it's a really valuable sort of provocation on our part. I feel like it was also partly because that one was following Simon Reynolds and we kind of wanted to really push what we thought rave could be. And uh, yeah, I just, because yeah, totally. I just, yeah, I just remember, like, yeah, after Tatine, like, the, it just didn't slow down once. <laughs> that was one of the most intense ones I've I ever like that. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I wanted, if I could, to either put a finer point on it or, I guess, invite you both to, which is that um, through a lot of Fisher's work and in, in this essay we've been reading uh, No Romance Without Finance as well, the theme of consciousness, whether that's class consciousness or consciousness raising, is this sort of continual theme in all, all of his work and in this essay. And I guess what I wanted to ask was in a sort of slightly pointed way, um, what is it for the Fisher or for 
you together or as a, or individually. What, what is it about a rave? That, how does that relate to the idea of consciousness or consciousness raising? Because that's one of his key sort of ideas, and you find it in sort of Plan C in general as well. This sort of sort of thinking about consciousness raising. How how does what does a rave what does a rave do for for consciousness raising or or for consciousness? It's funny because we we one of the nights that we did we kind of become they kind of always happen now like every January after the lecture. But there was I think the first year that we did it in twenty eighteen. Oh, we we also did we did uh, one that was around Mark's what would have been Mark's fiftieth birthday, and we did one that was like a month before just to just for the sake of it. I think we just wanted to do more of them because why not? Which was called cool, consciousness, really. Well, exactly. Though. But with a Z. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we had this like whole, we, we sort of wanted to structure a whole evening. We did like a total 12 hour. It was like a whole day. We had our own sort of bunch of workshops and lectures and things. And then we had like a dance party afterwards in this one space in Dalston. And kind of trying to openly ask that question in a way, because I mean, what I find really striking about that essay, the No Romance or Right Finance, is when like he starts off talking about this. Uh, what does he say? That um, He's talking about Jennifer M. Silver's book. And he sort of says that over and over again, Silver finds that her young subjects exhibiting a hardened self, a form of subjectivity that prides itself in its independence from others. And he kind of goes into why that's sort of a sort of a socioeconomic response. But I think what was, what was, I think, striking for all of us after Mark died was that that's just also like a grief response. And I remember, at least for me, I, I don't know... But I th- well, I assume it was kind of the same thing for everyone else. But I remember after Mark died, I didn't really go home apart from to sleep when I really had to. Like, I just didn't want to be on my own. I think like that's kind of just a general grief response, maybe. But it's kind of, I guess, that again, because I guess it's, it wasn't really a conscious thought. Again, it's like reading all of this in hindsight. It's like you sort of see why, even just at the level of of general sociality, you find sort of have that desire, and it's kind of like these texts that Mark has already written in a way that we maybe weren't necessarily immediately uh, aware of. I think a lot of us only really got properly into the sort of minutia of Mark's work after he died, because I think that's just, you don't really think you need to when someone's there to go get it directly or whatever. Um, but um, I guess what I'm trying, what am I trying to say? Like, the, There's a sense that there's nothing kind of more isolating than that kind of grief experience. And I think even maybe like, I think talking about it in the in the sense of the pandemic too like there's there's I, I feel like it's the one thing i end up talking about all the time whenever someone's like we me and natasha were doing it sort of before like um uh because we haven't spoken for a while before tonight and there's this sense that just how good for your mental health it is to just be around people like it's a really obvious point in a way but it's interesting how like lots of things in life, whether it's death, whether it's just having a really intense work schedule, like you're kind of denied that at a lot of opportunities and actually finding a space to really, when Mark died, it kind of turned that, that nest, that needs, that necessity up to 11, like the, 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 because the stakes felt so high that if you were on your own, who knows how you could end up feeling and how, you know, there was, it was sort of quite literally for our mental health that we'd sort of come together it just because it's healing and i guess that was uh, uh, i think when we all sort of realized the benefits of that in a way that that doing that just naturally in response to a trauma and maybe i don't this might even been something that you said Nat, but it was like you know what 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 if we just treated each other like this without a trauma like what why didn't we do this beforehand why wasn't there what was stopping us from you know spending every other night of the week just in a club not for the sake of like a kind of self-destructive hedonism, but just because it's where we could be together freely without any sort of like, you know, um, feeling like, I don't know, there was, there was, there was, there was a heightened element of, 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 of freedom from specifically going to a lot of, I, I remember my, some of my best experiences from that year in a way were going to this, like, uh, there was this like garage in Elephant and Castle that used to have uh, like proper free parties underneath this, like it was really weird place. I think it was in the news after. A, a while because it was sort of a bit it's kind of it was crazy space but but going there was sort of felt even more important in a way like there was a i don't know i'm just kind of rambling at this point but there's just something about that how fundamental that kind of break from your own individual in, interiority i should say is in a way that and i guess i'm, I'm rambling because I, i'm trying to figure out a way that this doesn't just sound like isn't it nice to have friends but 
because it's a truism in a way and it sounds a bit soft and wishy-washy but actually as like as as a form of political action even like it's it's so vital like the, it's it's it, what's the other thing that he says in um is it in no romance without finance where it's not so much about it's it's like producing a foundation for politics or something i had like a little thesis i would present for both of you just sort of thinking about just thinking about the how how this it's basically and we're doing this somewhat for the Repeater Books uh, release of Jungle, this thing about Jungle. And there's a quote about Jungle from the uh, Ghost of My Life, which he quotes uh, Kojo Eshin, about how Jungle is fundamentally libidinalization of anxiety. One of the, I think, the limits of the rave as this kind of... Because in a way, that, I mean, the 1994 Act against uh, you know, prohibited uh, repetitive beats in the fields also criminalized a lot of nomadic peoples, uh, GRT peoples in Britain. And there's a sense of a constant fight against the nomadism, the idea that space could be occupied and resisted, enclosure can be resisted. And to put on sort of like a very Jeremy Gilbert sort of style hat right now and talk about sort of the rave as a nomadic war machine, as one particular kind of nomadic war machine, and one that's quite potentially quite useful in terms of how it is so libidinally charged and people can be driven in because people like raving and they get an ecstatic sense of. of of the rave, not in the sense of drugs, but even in the sense of community. However, there's a limit to that, really, which is, as you're saying, there's actually like the, the formal limits of space, the formal limits of propriety, having it tied to institutions, and there's that kind of institutional capture, the capturing that, that happens with the state and the war machine. But at the same time, there is this, ra- this radical uh, kind of potential, ins- I like to say insurgent potential for the rave to occupy space and you know, to have that mentality of, fuck it, let the, <laughs> let the police come. And the morning to the jungle was the libidinalization of anxiety. And there's nothing more anxious than occupying a space that's illegal because you wonder when the hand of the state is coming to stop sweeping things away. And in terms of the idea of creating post capitalist desires, I was just thinking about given how Eshian and Fisher understand jungle, it seems like there's almost a kind of potential there to libidinalize within the rave space that kind of anxiety that comes with uh, occupying a space taking down enclosure, rejecting the cybernetics or control of spaces. And it seems like there's almost a, a latent insurgent property to the jungle rave. I would sort of let, leave that thesis there. Is the junglist insurrection, which is also out on Bandcamp for listeners who are on there, is that, is that, is that something that can be thought of in terms of uh, the idea of a post-capitalist desire? The post-capitalist desire is a desire for a rave, and if the cops come, fuck them. I think that like that's, it's something that I think you see in quite stark terms in a lot of conversations around dance music, but also just music in general at the moment. Um, I remember seeing a conversation on, it was probably techno Twitter, because that's where all the real arguments kick off. But um, it was about this general resurgence that we've seen over the past few years that I've definitely sort of fallen into, just around ambient music. And I guess that you can say ambient sort of starts, I mean, well, I guess there's a, there's a certain dance music resurgence of it, with it being like in the chill out space where you can kind of take a break from that anxiety. But I think there's also this sense that, you know, what happens when this, like, I think there's something to be said for how a lot of, like, of the most sort of outer reaches of um, of dance music ended up falling into that awfully named category of intelligent dance music, like the sort of IDM stuff that was, like, a lot of the initial Warp compilations were essentially talking about, like, uh, headphone listening like you know well if you can't go to the rave but you're still kind of into this sort of stuff well here's what here's one you can do at home with from the comfort of your sofa <laughs> but it's <laughs> but it's interesting cause like <laughs> well it's it, well it's interesting because when i think about like uh i guess the, the connection that i'm have, this is kind of a half-baked thought maybe but in talking about the the legislation around sort of 94 when they're, they're, they're specifically legislating against repetitive beats, right? And Orteca puts out that EP that I always forget the name of. Um, but they had on the label, they had like a, uh, it's almost like, like a performative EP where they have this um, long extended track and then they have a disclaimer on that's like, you can play this in the club and we encourage you to do so. Um, and though it sounds repetitive, we would we would invite any law enforcement to consult a musicologist who will tell you that you know, every single bar of this song is different, um, even though there's kind of a rhythm to it, right? And they're kind of, they're playing with that and it's great. 
And yet I'm kind of reminded of like living in London in like 27, 2018, 2019, like after Ortega did their like NTS sessions and like having like the entirety of that whole set of like six hours of music, putting it on my MP3 player that I held on to defiantly and never joined Spotify. And then we just like ride the tube. I had to go, I was, I had a job of my time. I was going from like Southeast London to like right out far uh west there's like an hour on the tube every day so i just put on this or tech mix and like um put it on shuffle and that music i think is like is is so anxious same with like actress actress another one the actress's album ghettoville i think the first time i listened to that in full i was very stoned and i can't really listen to it because it makes me generally feel really anxious it's not a pleasurable listening experience for me even though i kind of but i still kind of actually like both of their stuff right it's like that, that literal libidinization of anxiety i feel like is like if you can't if this like it, it it's that form of in, of of enclosure that is kind of placed on the rave and i think it almost is extends like an expression of how that's also the case for the individual that if i can't go to a free party and sort of feel that buzz of like just riding that kind of that, that drum and bass and wondering when the cops are going to show I'm just going to sit on the tube and listen to this other music in my own little world and just kind of rile myself up into a state of agitation because this music is kind of stressing me out. And that being, a, and that somehow being enjoyable, like there's some weird trajectory there. But, you know, I feel like, so in that sense, I feel like the thesis, you know, is, is def, it totally has merit, obviously. To kind of call back around, there was this techno Twitter thing about like, why is everyone obsessed with ambient music at the moment? Why is it always like end of your lists or whatever? Or like, so and so's like blissful 60 minute album of like nice drones and things like why is it what's changing where we're now seeking that kind of in the, that interior comfort rather than listening to stuff that's gonna rile you up and gonna make you want to smash the stake <laughs> like is there what you know and 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 that's not i don't really have an answer to this but i kind of feel like these are kind of questions that are actively sort of being explored even by you know not even in sort of explicitly theoretical terms it's just like this is the stuff that people are producing and that's that kind of to lose a guitarian point again right it's like it, the, the desiring production is like it's not it's as if to say that capitalist production is done to to sate your desires but then the desires that aren't sated but what do they produce like inverting that kind of process right um and i feel like when you when it comes to a lot of music these days that's kind of what you hear like what is the, uh it doesn't necessarily have a name we don't really have to express what that affect is but then that's mark's point that you know a lot of popular culture or even underground culture whatever else a lot of music will can prefigure these conversations that we might have in five ten years time but these are emotions that are coming out of music that don't necessarily have um uh, a thesis to attach to them nevertheless allow us to focus in on and maybe then you know talk about that later but they're literally it's 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 um i mean and it's kind of goes back to the whole like mark's main sort of foundation being at like warwick and also at the university of birmingham of sadie plant like the switch in the ccru of like not um cultural cultural studies as cultural production um and I feel like that's where Mark was at. And I kind of feel like that's in our own way where we are. I mean, I don't think me and neither me or Natasha make music, but I feel like there's something to be said for when you put on a night, you put on a rave, you put on an event, you you gather people together and try and make some sort of scene that you're doing that too. It's not to say that we've got answers and you can come and just find them if you come and dance with us for a couple of hours. But actually, you know, when, when you collectively experience these emotions, like that's the kind of consciousness raising thing, right? That consciousness raising is sort of expressing your individual problems when you realize the collective problems. Well, what if you have, they haven't formed individually yet? And what if that's precisely because there are, there are obstacles to you forming that kind of, those modes of expression? Well, I feel like raves can do that. They, it's sort of non-linguistically maybe or sort of outside of language they are the the what is the, the unrepresented affects emerge from there that if we kind of come together as collectively and think them through and even just dance through them who knows how they might collate and then five years down the line we're talking we you know that they've, they've they've implicitly shaped a conversation about a world we can build um which is i guess that's Maybe to go back to you talking about the libidinalization of anxiety, if only because that sounds kind of horrible. It's kind of, I don't think that's what anybody wants to happen. But 
like it's i feel like that's a platform for coming out of that right like i mean maybe natasha because you had the (laughs) the, there was the group that you set up with mark was the fresh new anxieties right maybe does the relation to that for you or i'll shut up now because i've already gone for a while but Uh, when i used to think of a lot about mental health and sort of particularly anxiety and like especially this thing of like liberalization of anxiety i mean hearing you speak just then about these different things it's sort of like as someone who used to be very anxious and it's like something I could never understand were these kind of like cool down, calm down albums because it felt, it was at a complete odds with how I felt. And it was kind of like, like I always, personally, I've always found those kind of like chill out things to be actually more aggravating because it, it like it always, it always uh, devalued or devalidated how I was feeling. And it's also so when you're talking about libidinization of anxiety through kind of like jungle or, I mean, for me, like, especially like hardcore and punk, um, <laughs> like it's kind of like, those, those were all, for me, have always been the most enjoyable because it's kind of like, it's a validation. It's what Mark talks about in No Romance Against Finance. It's like, it's like the way these musics, actually, these musics, this music <laughs> actually validates how you're feeling. And it's something I didn't really understand until recently as, as that's what's happening as, why actually um, like punk and hardcore and jungle and rave like actually had a kind of cathartic effect just because it was validating and that like <laughs> I didn't really realize that it was like oh right and it's like especially with even like hyper pop and all these kind of things like especially when you're so tapped into a highly accelerated highly anxious like society for me it's like hyper pop punk, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop repeating genres but <laughs> It's kind of like those were the things that made sense. Like it's kind of like they they kind of, it just made sense. And it's like and I think when we're talking about consciousness deflation as well on a on a, on a mass scale, it's like yeah, it's like it's why you have ten hour chill out mixes because it's people trying to deny the actual reality they live in. And it's why rave and it's why punk, it's why hardcore and it's why hyper pop often like aren't for everyone. It's because it's like it's like. I just feel like people sometimes don't allow themselves to tap into what it actually validates for them. And it's like, and I think it's what I always find funny is like, even especially with punk, like the way that people talk about of like, oh, you like angry music. You must be really angry. I'm not angry. And it's just kind of like, are you not though? Like, <laughs> like just because you listen to Ed Sheeran doesn't mean you're not crawling up the fucking Shouldn't walls. Shouldn't you be? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's that kind of thing. And I think it's what, I think it's, again, when we talk about professionalization and the managerial class and all these kind of things that, like, were, these brick walls were constantly up against. It's just sort of like, like, I'm not sat here going, like, oh, I'm so enlightened because I listened to this. It's like, it's more kind of like, where the fuck is your anger and how do we a- open that and how do we access that for you? Whether it's your anger or your joy, just some kind of, like, excess of feeling. And in short, that's what we, that's that's that that's what like these kind of spaces and these kind of uh, these these collective moments have always been about. It's kind of like in 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 a society in which you're you're so encouraged to completely deny how you feel and that anger and that frustration or even that joy and that excitement and something is always there to deaden it. It's kind of like how do you activate that and how do you get that like. Uh, don't have the words for it. I can only do hand like excited hand gestures. <laughs> but yeah, it's just like ha. Ah. And because I just kept coming back to like that closing bit of like no romance without finance. Like it's like capitalist realism was a 30-year hiatus and consciousness is being raised again. And it's like when we talk about that activeness, it's like it's just like that's on us. It's not for someone else to do, it's for all of us to do it. And this is what me and Matt have talked a lot about. It's like, it's and it's not for me and Matt to do either. It's for all of us to like just get involved with it. And it's like, sorry, I'm going really hopped off now. But it's like, but that's the thing. Cause it's always the thing for me that was with like, that was with Mark's texts was the fact that there was always the call to action. Every almost every text ends with a call to action, with a kind of with a provocation and a call to action, and that's the most exciting thing. And like, um. But yeah, I mean, but also just I try not to jump around too much. But uh, but also, yeah, I mean, a friend of mine, Kitty, is actually doing a radio show called Baroque Sunbursts, um, <laughs> which is on Slack's radio. And it's just and it's just 
yeah, I don't know, like in terms of these kind of, um, it's just to come back again of seeing his work work through all of us and how important that is. And it's not, it's not about waiting for someone else to do it for you. It's not about being like, oh God, they listen to angry music, my God. It's about like, how do we activate each other in a way that like, both validates how we're feeling, that anger and that frustration, that excitement and that joy, but also means that we can care for one another through like the brick walls we're constantly like running into. I kind of wanted to add that there was like, um, it's the one thing that I always think of in terms of um, like how a lot of the rave stuff's almost um, structured maybe as an escape or as some kind, well, or as escapism. Um, and I guess it's kind of, it comes with the territory when you talk about like a way that pushes outside of bureaucracy. But I kind of always feel like that it's one thing that I've been trying to figure out recently in trying to, there's like a lot of the philosophies that Mark was reading, like Deleuze, Badiou, um, basically those two, but also someone like Laruel or what, the stuff that they were sort of all being taught a lot at Warwick. Um, and they were sort of in, in, in this postgrads in the nineties. There's this like weird paradox in a lot of that stuff where, um, their philosophies of imminence. So there is no outside, but at the same time, which is, you know, true of capitalism, there's, where, where there is no outside to capitalism. But what's ironic about it is that it still produces a sense of interiority. And there's this paradox that you can't talk about an outside, but you can still talk about an inside. Um, and I kind of feel like that that's the, in a way, that's like the tension that happens in a lot of the rave stuff, where we're talking about, um, in a way, doing something that's outside the perceived value structure of society, but nevertheless doesn't and doesn't and can't leave that society behind us. And it's what my my um, it's kind of just reminded of the like this the, the talking about the ambient stuff the, the the or even just like chill out playlists of sort of being in denial. I always think about Terry Tamlitz, who has that uh, doing uh, house music and there's that uh, their album uh, Midtown One Eighty Blues, I think. Um, I'm awful with names for things, um, but there's the the intro to that album um, is this whole thing of like it's a really it's a, it's a really chill out album, but it, um, the, the sort of intro is you know this isn't this isn't an escape from reality. This is this is almost like you know we let um, the, the line is something like let's let's hold on to that thing that we're trying to momentarily escape from, and I feel like that's kind of the sort of duality of of doing a lot of this stuff in a way. It's not just about escaping and having respite from the world outside. It's actually, no, like, well, as Natasha's perfectly put it, really, with a, uh, the, the, there's that, it's the, the, ang- the, 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 the energy that you're bringing to the, to this space is an energy that's just, yeah, that's, that's, that's wholly deflated. And it's, and it's, the energy is, I feel like it's that the, when we talk about that kind of energy, what, precisely what's caught up in that, as if it's like an excess that's just going to, it's not an excess that has to just be like, um, just just spent and blown in that environment, right? It's not a kind of like, it's not wanking into a rave sock sort of thing. Like there's, <laughs> it's, it's a, it's a, it is a, it's, it's precisely that call to, sorry, that's really grotesque, but that kind of, you know, it, but it's a call to action, right? It's like, I feel like I mean, that's the one thing that I always took away from like when we'd have these nights and everyone would be sort of stumbling out afterwards, like 4 a.m. It was never like they're going to go home and sleep, but people would always feel super energized about this stuff. Like they had the lecture, then they've come and danced for four hours and then they're like, fuck, no, I just really want to get out there and do shit. And I feel like that's like, it's it's a way of like awakening that in you and then you take it back into where you come from. You take that anger and that energy and that sort of, and, and that joy and you channel it back into like the non-rave at the same time. Like there has to be some sort of, because yeah, because they're imminent. Because it's not an it's not an outside. It's an escape. It's something that you're. It's it's a focal point where you're bringing this shit out, and then you're just working with it in the rest of your daily life. And I feel like that's that's like if there's a if there's a call to action in just having a rave, like maybe it's 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 maybe not spoken, but it's implicit. It's baked into the thing.